All right, sorry. Uh, going, gone. Uh, past time here. So let's see. Um, so we're going to continue on today where we left off. So I've got some more stuff that uh, I think will be useful to talk about from the chapter two and the end of the end examples and beyond that. Um, so um, as a reminder, I haven't really officially given um, the second assignment yet. So I definitely am making some changes onto it. So it'll probably be ready by next Tuesday, but wait, wait for me to uh, you know, to, to let you loose on it. You still have plenty of time for the assignment to uh, you have all next week and the week after that. So, um, but I'm uh, fixing a few things on it yet. I didn't quite get them done today. Um, and uh, I think that's it for announcement. So we've got uh, a little bit of time before the next, uh, you know, the next uh, assess the next assignment is due. Uh, so we still got time for the work on it. So this week, um, you know, um, so today we'll go ahead and talk some more about some of the chapter two examples, and then starting next week, um, we're going to be getting into uh, actual machine learning. So you know. Um, um, yeah, so um, you know we're going to continue on with like chapter uh, three and four uh, next couple of weeks, and we'll get into like some of the the the, the fundamental stuff, so classification versus regression, and um, doing some particular kinds of model like linear regression and uh, logistic regression. Um, all right, anyway. So, oh, um, so last time, um, I'd only kind of talked about the first, there's three notebooks on the chapter two, the in example. Um, and uh, we've gotten down to, I don't know, we, we got kind of past visualizing, although uh, I think we're ready to start looking at the correlations. Um, one thing, uh, also, you know, you might, I, it turned out that uh, the, this notebook wasn't running. Um, so I went in and pushed the fix. Um, but uh, let me just tell you about that. Uh, you know, so I uh, had, hadn't caught that before we started working on this. So apparently, um, um, uh, so the notebook looked look like this if you did it before. Let me go ahead and rerun everything. run everything above that. So. so this notebook shouldn't take too long, but uh, actually there is some stuff in one of the notebooks where it's actually building the model. It might take some time here. Um, so um, this uh, notebook, um, so something apparently has changed in the, uh, in the pandas data frame. Um, if you're running it the way that we had it, uh, you get a message because uh, basically what's happening here is um, uh, you can kind of tell from the error messages. Um, so the housing data frame had all the columns that we talked about, including that one that uh, got read in as a string or it, was, it shows up as an object in the data frame. So just to remind, remind you of that. So one of the first things we did um, after loading the uh, housing, after we got the data um, was... Um, Uh, was look at some of the um, you know uh, functions like the info function. And here's the kind of one I was looking for. So um, all the there's like ten or eleven columns or ten or eleven features in the data set. Most all of them are numeric except for that one, the ocean proximity. We haven't looked at uh, how we are going to convert that into a categorical variable yet. Um, uh, we'll do here, uh, but at the moment it's a string um, or or an it's called an object in the pandas data frame here. You know? So um, I guess it used to be that that uh, it would either just ignore those. So so here we're calling a method called core, which is actually uh, calculating correlation between every feature and every other feature in the data. Um, but uh, but yeah, to use the the code that we had in there it wasn't working, so we had to fix something. So uh, you could do a git pull, 
um, or I mean, you just copy what I did here. So the easiest thing is uh, we'll worry about that, that the string variable and Oracle variable later. So uh, just create a, um, um, a um, data frame um, where we drop that column. So we're just creating a, a temporary da data frame um, and uh, using it to calculate the, um, the, the correlation between things. Right. So that was the only fix I think that I had on the notebooks I was looking at today. Uh, looking at to uh, try out today. You know. so if you do that, um, oh, you know, a couple of things, uh, some aside, I'll come back to this here, but um, um, the um, two things I wanted to mention. Um, I, I was convinced that it wasn't something that had broken in the notebook because if you use the uh, use the notebooks from the official repository for the hands-on machine learning class, uh, it does the same thing with with the version of pandas that we have. So yeah, so something obviously changed a little bit. Now pandas does that function probably. Uh, but I did want to mention, um, you know, if you haven't, um, I didn't have the um, links. Uh, if you look in the additional resources, there's a bunch of good stuff in there. Uh, but there, we do have links now for the um, um, uh, the code repositories. I guess it's not all that easy to find in the you read the, uh, the preface of the textbook. So you can go there and, and, and get those. I encourage you to get those to fill in. Um, um, and see uh, uh, what they used in there. So these are just regular GitHub repositories. You can do a clone, do a copy of all the stuff if you want to. Um, and the other thing, since we're talking about correlation here, um, I, I wanted to mention before I go on, um, there was, starting with this unit, um, if you look at the suggested kinds of things to do, the activities, um, or I guess starting next week is where I have the links to them. So let me find that real quick. I guess it wasn't this one, next week. I'm sorry, no, this week. So um, yeah, unit three here. Um, um, I did kind of, uh, mention uh, if you're looking at the activities uh, that there are some stuff to do some review here, calculus, linear algebra, and uh, probability and stats. Um, so since we're doing a correlation, maybe I'll just uh, I'll mention those. Um, um, oh, and also the actually probably the most important notebook um, is this uh, one on the scikit-learn stats model before you do the assignment. But I'm going to talk about that next Tuesday. I just want to finish up uh, these things from our textbook uh, chapter two here today. Uh, but um, um, if you got, if you have some time, uh, it might be good. Uh, this might be a good point to uh, maybe review a couple things. If you look, look in the lecture uh, subdirectory, there's a couple of notebooks. I, I don't know. I don't know if the, know if the linear algebra one is that useful. I need to update that one. But, um, um, you know, uh, these are kinds of things that um, um, kind of I know what we're going to go over in the class. So uh, these are some topics on probability, um, calculus, and on linear algebra that would be good to be familiar with to help you uh, do stuff faster or understand things at a, at a deeper level. Right? So in particular, right, if you don't really know what correlations are, uh, things like that, so some of that is... Um, um, covered in here, um, although most of this is, you know, some basic things. So I, I do hope people know, for example, some basic concept of probability and statistics, or you know, how it is, what we mean by a probability space, uh, how we would uh, uh, define a basic probability. You know, so when you start right off and talking about probability, you know, we start talking about things like sample space, so we have two possible outcomes, that's the point, and uh, they're equally likely. Um, we can talk about then, you know, what the sample space is and what the probability is of getting one of those items on any particular uh, event, you know, like flipping the coin once or, you know, and then you, we can also do things like uh, 
figure out combinations, uh, permutations of things, and then use that to calculate more, uh, you know, uh, uh, complex sort of thing. But but basic probability really does come down to figuring out all the possible outcomes and then counting up the number of ways that the outcome of interest can happen in a probability space or an outcome space. So you know, if you're flipping one coin uh, and rolling a six-sided dice. Uh, there's 12 possible outcomes. And so you can ask, what's the probability of getting an even number um, and uh, have, having a head on the point and even number on the top? Right. So since there's 12 total, uh, but there's three things where I have a head and an even number. Right? So the probability of that outcome is 3 and 12 or 25%. Anyway, yeah, so it shouldn't go all over. The rest of these, so most of these, I mean, will be useful. Um, although I don't know if we talk about correlation in here, but in particular, um, like if you understand what the the, the normal distribution is, or what a um, um, what a uniform distribution is, or a normal distribution, um, some of those concepts you'll need for various things in this class. Um, And uh, like I said, it'd be good to review some linear algebra, although I'm not certain if the notebook I have in there is too useful. Uh, there's also some things in calculus that would be uh, useful. Although this one, later on, we're going to be talking about gradient descent uh, as kind of a primary way that we uh, set up an optimization problem to build a model. Um, so we can use gradient descent for pretty much most of the stuff we talk about in this class. Uh, to understand that, stuff, we still have a, a, a two or three weeks before we'll kind of get to that point. Uh, but before that, it might be a good idea to understand uh, or review. Hopefully, there's a bit of review for most people. Uh, derivatives um, and um, uh, you know, what we mean by slope and intercepts and limited limits and uh, how you uh, calculate the derivative of something, that kind of thing. So, we might come back and so integrals and derivatives. Uh, but uh, this might be useful for you, um, especially before we get to that point, if you need to review a bit, um, some basic calculus and concepts. Um, anyway. Let's move on. Let's go back to this. Uh, my plan is mostly here to uh, finish up then these uh, notebooks um, about the the big picture sort of thing from chapter two. Talk some more about um, some of the concepts that are introduced in there. Um, so, you know, at this point where we left off last time, we're really still doing sort of data discovery, you know, sort of exploration, exploring the data set is usually easier. One of the first things you're going to do when you want to build a model, or one, one of the first things that's useful to do is to ask, okay, I've got these features. Uh, which one of those features uh, seem uh, correlated with, with which others? Or even more important, which of those features that I have uh, most correlated with the thing I'm trying to predict, which is the uh, price of houses here, right? So, um, um, and, and that's kind of what, uh, you know, so we, we only see here, we see the correlations between all the other features and the median house value, which is ultimately going to go model. Right? So um, if you don't know how these work, this is probably using the Pearson correlation, this, this core function. So notice, I mean, housing here is really just a pandas data frame. So that's just a method that you can call on a pandas data frame. Um, and uh, I don't exactly show it. It actually returns a full matrix of, of every feature in the row, and every feature in the column, and the correlation between them, basically, um, when, when you do core. Yeah. Right. So, uh, probably would have been useful to show that uh, the, the raw result of that. So, really, every row, you know, every feature is a row and a column. For a lot of correlation between every feature and every other feature. Of course, 
Um, so if you don't know what correlation is, uh, a correlation of one means they're perfectly correlated. So as, as we would expect at that angle, this is all one because every feature is perfectly correlated with itself. So correlation uh, can range from negative one to one. So things can be perfectly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a negative, negative one means they're perfectly correlated, but in the opposite direction. Every time, every time something is high, the other feature is low. Every time that feature is low, uh, the other feature is high. It has a negative, very high negative range. So correlations can range from negative one to one. Um, and if it's zero, it means that they don't seem to be correlated at all. So there, there's no predicted value when you evaluate one feature. You can't tell them what the other feature is going to do. Um, so looking at so we're just looking at here, uh, and we sorted them. We're looking at the correlation between the, the median house value and all the others. Of course, it's perfectly correlated with itself. So what we're really interested in here is um, uh, uh, the thing we're trying to predict, what other things look like they might be useful. Because right? things that are highly correlated are probably going to give us the most information uh, to be able to use that to build a model to predict the house values for houses that we haven't seen before. Right? So the highest one is income, which makes sense. So if you're a you know, county or whatever the units are in California, uh, if the median income of the population is high, the house prices are high. Um, but you know, also maybe um, um, somewhat surprisingly, uh, so it, something that's highly negatively correlated can also be useful for prediction. Uh, so if I have something that has a negative one correlation, a really high negative correlation, that's going to be useful for prediction as well. So it's really the how how big these numbers are, how far away they are from zero, whether they're going to be useful. It's just that a negative correlation, you know, we just have for divergence. Uh, so but it might be surprising um, as to why the latitude end up, um, you know, it ends up actually being the second highest magnitude it's actually a little bit more correlated than total rooms, although total rooms is in the positive direction. Right? The latitude is in the negative direction. Um, and, um, um, well, yeah, I don't know if there's a good answer, if I have a good answer for that uh, off the top of my head, or we'll, we'll not come back to that. But, but this, these are correlations. Was that? Yeah, so that's a good hypothesis, right? Um, so uh, that was something I was going to kind of show. We, we showed these visualizations before. I don't think I talked a whole lot about them, but um, uh, you'll find, uh, oh, there was one thing that, that I skipped over, uh, but I did want to mention. You know, so another thing that, that I didn't really mention when we showed the um, distributions of the plots, the, the latitude and longitude was on there. They looked kind of uh, bimodal which would be kind of a bit strange maybe, uh, but it's not strange for the California data if you look at it, because basically like from this figure here, you can kind of see it is that, you know, we're, we're plotting actually a map. So, so you know, it's, it's uh, longitude, which is the east-west uh, position of things, latitude the north south. But California basically has two big population centers as the Los Angeles area and as the, the Bay area, you know, California. So, um, so that's why we got the bimodal, both on latitude and longitude. This roughly corresponds to most of the population being at those two latitudes and those two longitudes. Um, although there is kind of a third concentration of population. Uh, you notice that these are all uh, at lower house values. This is the kind of the agricultural area. Population like earth in, the, in those regions out there. Um, anyway, no, that just some things that if you know some things about California, uh, some of that information makes sense, uh, like looking at the distributions of things like latitude and longitude and stuff. Um, all right. So let's run the rest of these. Um, when we're building a model, correlation uh, roughly is a measure of actually the linear correlation, which is kind of another concept that uh, we'll probably talk about more later. But um, 
I don't know. So here's another way of instead of using a, a measure, we're trying to visualize. So if we just plot every feature to every other feature. Um, actually, we're not plotting every feature. So here, uh, again, this probably came directly from the textbook. So we picked some of the ones that had high correlation uh, or the highest ones. So like median house value, um, or, which is the one we're interested, but like median income, total rooms, uh, and uh, the median age. And so the top three positive ones. Maybe we should have thrown latitude in there as well, but um, but um, but here, yeah, yeah. If there's a correlation, what it would show up in is that um, as the independent variable moves, the, the dependent one has a uh, corresponding uh, regular chain, right? So it shows up as something that, uh, and of course, there's a lot of noise in here. Uh, none of these have really high correlations, but. Um, um, our biggest one was um, the median income. So, you know, most likely what that has. So what we're showing here is, you know, this is the correlation between median income and um, um, uh, the, oh, well, the other one, the median, ho median house value, right? So that's, that's the one we're interested in is the median uh, house value. Um, uh, but you can see that, uh, that, if you, if you know what is being measured by correlation, that should make sense here that uh, the other ones are, are uh, much more, um, you know, like we look at the correlation between uh, total rooms and the median house value. It's, it's much less clear if there's some sort of, like where you can draw a line, um, a, a relationship between those two measurements. Um, Anyway, so this is all useful kind of stuff uh, before you get into building models to know a little bit about your data, right? So, um, but yeah, from this, we're kind of thinking that um, these features might be the most useful um, uh, for predictions if we wanted to drop some features or, you know, might be less households or total bedrooms or population a little bit surprisingly might be a little bit less useful in predicting um, the value of houses, uh, which is what we're trying to do here. Um, so to zoom in on the, the, uh, the median income um, and how it correlates. Notice, uh, I think the textbook mentioned these. So notice again, this is all part of data exploration. So one of the big things when you visualize stuff is anything looks strange or not out of it. There's obviously, um, I mean, we, we talked about that there's a, a, a ceiling effect on this data. So probably the people that gathered this data, any house value, median house value for a region that was larger than something, they capped it off at 500,000. That's why we get more of those. But you can clearly see that there's some other places, right, where it looks like you can see a similar kind of a cap. So even for places with lower income, uh, see houses yeah, particular ranges here um, those probably are can be explained by uh, the you know people like to have nice round numbers so we've got you know houses at 350,000 or something like that rather than some number like 355,570 dollars um, Although, you know, if that is true, I would have expected maybe something clearer, like 400,000 and 200,000. So maybe, maybe not. That's what's going on there. Could also be an artifact of the data gathering. So again, uh, the same way that they were clipping values above 500,000, um, they might have been just uh, 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 some people that were gathering this data we're rounding up or down to 10,000. It doesn't look like all the values were doing that, but maybe some people that were gathering this data uh, were doing a little bit of rounding to some significant value here. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, they, they give some examples of, of creating new attributes. I'm, I'm gonna uh, 
not say much about that. Although, you know, this is another example that we're actually adding new columns, so new attributes to the uh, to the data frame. Um, and again, this 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 cell doesn't run with the most recent version of and is to correct them. So, but, but yeah, if we just do the correlation on the numeric values again. Um, we can see that adding in those new features, none of them um, um, uh, were uh, any better than the median income, although let's see, the, the, which ended up being best. So, you know, we've got the uh, rooms per household might be useful. So that was actually a higher, oh, and bedrooms per room also ended up being uh, of higher magnitude. So, so, yeah, I mean, those might be useful more useful than the, uh, the the total rooms that we had before or the latitude. Um, all right. So yeah, my goal is to get through the rest of the, the chapter two things here. Um, so let's look at this one. This one, I don't know if I've run or rerun this one because um, this one might have been, or maybe it's the next one where we're training our models. Um, okay, so mostly um, in uh, this part of the chapter two, we're talking about uh, doing the preliminary data preparation before we're ready to build anything. So most of what go, goes on here uh, is we have to deal with uh, bad data or missing data, and figure out what we're gonna do with that, right? Uh, I might've rearranged the order a little bit. Another thing that we wanna do is um, um, wanna talk about uh, how we build a model and how we test it in machine learning. So we'll come back to this topic multiple times probably, but um, the, the thing that we usually do when we build a model uh, in, machine, in the context of machine learning is uh, we're going to um, take our data, but we're not going to use all of the data that we have to train a model. Instead, we will save some data uh, that, that we don't use when we're building a model. Uh, we call that the test set. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll get some of our data, put it aside, uh, so only use part of our data to create a model with it. And then we will uh, see how well it does on data it's never seen before, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, real quickly, why do we do that? The, the problem is, is that when you build a machine learning model using whatever, um, the, uh, one of the biggest problems is overfitting. So if I train on a set of data, it's very easy to build a model that will work really well on the data that you're training. So it, uh, it, it'll work really well or even perfect, make perfect predictions. But the problem with that is, is if the model was overfit, uh, it works well with the data it's seen, but as soon as you ask it to make predictions on data that it wasn't training, uh, it's going to perform very poorly. Uh, you'll get a better idea, idea why that's the case when you start talking about learning and regression in more detail. Uh, but you know, to, to fight overfitting, um, we we have to um, evaluate the performance of our models on data it wasn't trained. Right? It really doesn't mean anything if it's getting really good performance on the same data that we created the model. The real question is, how does it, you know does it actually still perform well on data that it wasn't trained? And we never saw it. Before. So that's the, the basic idea of a test set. Um, and um, our textbook, uh, there's a lot, there's actually a lot of subtleties, uh, you know, so most of the stuff that we do in this class, we just, we just can do a very simple, we we'll just split the data and 80% will use for training and say the other way for the test. Right? Um, and we'll do that usually randomly. And so if we have our data set, we might shuffle it up, make sure it's nice and random, and then pick 80% of it at random or whatever, um, and use that to train our model. Uh, so um, 
so yeah, I mean, Python makes it really easy to uh, do that kind of thing. Um, uh, although we can also use scikit-learn, uh, it has methods specifically for um, uh, splitting data. Let's see, I have to remind myself what our, what we did in our textbook here. Um, so for example, you know, we're, we're still using the, the full raw housing data set. We haven't done much of it yet at this point to reduce the, the notebooks that I made. Um, so the idea is, you know, before we start doing anything with it, um, let's um, um, split it up. So, you know, the simplest one is like I already talked about, you know, we can just do a, a random split here. Um, uh, so like like this, you know, this method, we're passing in uh, a ratio. Right? So we want 20% of the data to be held back for test set and the rest of the data gets returned as a training set. Um, that's what we're doing when we call it here. Um, and really, this example here, we're just doing it by hand, right? So um, we can, um, um, we can, um, um, oh, well, we're doing something a little bit more complicated here. So, uh, but, but we're using NumPy, or Pandas, Pandas, uh, data frames allow you to do the same thing. Okay? So here we're going to be doing a kind of um, uh, fancy indexing, right? So, but this is an example of to show how you might do a random, random train test for it. Right? Well, all we do is um, um, we we uh, create a, an array of values that are indexes into the rows, basically. So the length of our data here is gonna be the number of rows, the number of samples that we have, whether it's a data frame or a number of array, right? Um, so what random permutation does, well, let's say that there was just 10 rows, um, random permutation, that was making simple with five rows. Um, I'll try to do this better uh, if I just do it in here. Um, so, uh, although I might have to re rerun or do my imports here, but, um, just to show what, um, This is doing here. So, all this is doing is um, given a uh, size there, it creates an array uh, with the indexes zero through five in this case, but it randomly shuffles it. But then you can think of that as now as an array. So, we could use fancy indexing to select out only um, the particular rows that we want. And, and so that, that's all we're doing. This, this is probably what scikit-learn does if you use the, the basic random train test split. You do it, right? So, so we get this, although you know, in this case, however many samples we have, we're gonna end up with an array of all the indexes randomly shuffled here. Um, but then we just use um, um, regular um, Python slicing, right? So uh, since we, we made certain that everything was randomized in the indexes. Uh, we take the first, um, you know, eighty percent. So, so if our test ratio uh, is twenty percent, um, um, or what we're doing here, like this twenty percent, we're gonna figure out how many actual values. So, if we have a thousand values, we multiply that times the ratio. We'll end up with the, we want to test that size of two hundred. And we just use straightforward slicing here. Right? So we'll end up taking the first 200 items of the randomly shuffled things to be our uh, things we're going to pull out for the test data set, and then the other things from 200 to the end. So, like 200 to 1,000, if we had 1,000 items, you know, uh, we'll go into the training data set. And then, here, what's happening here is we're using. Uh, uh, um, yeah, in this case, yeah. So I don't know. This probably won't work if we pass in the NumPy array. This really is assuming uh, a pandas data frame because iLoc is only a, a pandas data frame kind of thing. 
Uh, but here, so this, this is a pandas data frame. If we pass in the indices, um, it'll only pull out those indices. So the, the 200 random samples that we want, uh, that we figured out from doing the shuffle, get pulled out for the training data, and then the other 800 uh, random samples pulled out for the test set. Um, yeah, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm spending too long on that, but it's good to know what's happening here, even on the simplest case, right? So um, this will work. Um, one thing to be careful about is sometimes when you have a data set, the data set will be sorted in some way. So, you know, th this one will work even if the data set is sorted because we are creating basically a random sample. Right? But sometimes you'll see people, if the data set is already sorted, um, I can kind of skip this step. I can just uh, take, you know, the first 200 items in the uh, the data frame or the array, the first 200 rows uh, as the test set, and then the last 800, right? But that would only work if the data is already kind of uh, randomly shuffled up, right? If it's not, you need to do something to make certain that you randomly shuffle it. So this is one way you can do that is create a random shuffling of the indices, which are going to be uh, the sample numbers that we want to pull out, basically. Um, anyway, so for our, our for our actual housing data set, we had um, a, a, bit, a bit over 20,000. Um, so if we use 20% uh, um, with this made up data, uh, this made up function, uh, we end up getting 1,600 approximately, a bit over on the uh, test, the, the training set. So usually you, you'll want to use most of your data for training. The more data you have, the better your model is going to be. So when you do a, a simple train test split, it's typical to use only 20, keep back maybe 20%, 25%, maybe 15%, something like that. Keep that back for the testing and, and use the majority of it for the training. Uh, so that's what we did here. So what's returned? From this is really um, um, no, a new data frame, right? And so we keep that. So after this point, we've got one data frame called train set, which has that many samples. And we have one data frame called test set, which has that many samples. Um, So, um, yeah, um, I did want to mention one more thing. I mean, because uh, somewhere I think you might have to do some stratified shuffling or stratified sampling, one of the assignments. Um, so there are some um, sort of subtle issues with uh, splitting data like this so we can use it for machine learning. Um, um, one example of that um, is given in the textbook here when, when it talks about doing the stratified sampling. So the problem is, is that if we just do, so when you do a split like that, you really are doing a kind of a sampling procedure. So this again, you know, this is a concept from statistics. Uh, you take a, especially a course in doing um, experimental methods, statistics where you talk about sampling biases and things like that. So whenever you're splitting data for a train test um, split, you're really trying to pull out sample. You have to be careful that your sample is representative. If you do something to pull a sample of the train through the model, and it's not representative of the data for some reason, the modeling train won't be expected to be. So to make that concrete, um, 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 here, the um, um, if you look at um, the, um, uh, this is by ID. Um, yeah, if we go back and look to that, that category. Um, so here, um, we haven't done much with the, um, Oh, I'm sorry, no, um, so we're doing something a little bit different here. Uh, for this example, uh, 
we're, we're trying to make the argument that it's important that our data sets that we train with is re has representations of, of the full range of the, uh, the average income for, the, uh, for each of the regions that we have. Right. So, you know, one thing we might ask, okay, what does that look like? What, what does the, the dis distribution of the median income look like? Right. So here we've shown uh, plotting that uh, kind of artificially here, but actually we, we've changed the uh, median income into, we, we made it into a set of discrete categories. So this is another example of a categorical variable that we're creating from the original data set. So, the original data set had median incomes um, um, that could be any value, right? Um, uh, but here we uh, we we bin it into you know median incomes from zero to one point five, one point five to three, and so on. So if you do that, uh, this is the the raw count. So we're just doing a histogram. This is the raw count of the number of things that ended up right. So we we've, we've got the majority of things that are in the Middle incomes, um, not as many items, at the really lowest income data set of this discrete category, um, and, and, and less have the, on the higher end as well. Um, so, um, Um, I was uh, just wanted to uh, I'll just mention this, remind this. So we, we talked a little bit about the median income. So um, it's it's not exactly, uh, it's really coded in some way. So that's why um, if we go back and look at the distribution uh, for the median income that we had when we first plotted all these distributions, Um, um, it doesn't quite make sense because you'd expect the, the median incomes to be uh, like in thirty thousand dollar, forty thousand dollars, California, whatever the data was collecting. Um, oh yeah, so we actually did discuss that uh, up here. So uh, this is this was being coded some way. Um, so you, you can approximately, though, um, think. Uh, of that is in terms of thousands of dollars. So one represents a median income of a thousand dollars, although it's not exactly that. Uh, but yeah, you can see the distribution. But so when we did this in the categories, we kind of uh, mostly divide everything up from zero to six, and everything above that ended up in the largest one. But you know, we have, we have kind of a large, long tail of things with really high incomes um, in our data set. Um, we only went up to five. Yeah, we went up to six. This actually is the counts of things from four point five to six. Um, so the basic argument is is that if you think that income uh, is going to be important uh, to building a good model, we need to make certain that in the sample of the data for our test set, we have roughly the same distribution of income. Median income in, in our data set we train. Uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. So, by creating this categorical variable, we can do a more sophisticated sort of sampling, the, the strat stratified um, sampling here, so that it will sample, but it will make certain that the data that it sampled uh, has roughly uh, items in the same proportions. Uh, in the, the data that we end up sampling, as, as is shown here. So we want to end up with both our training set and our test set. If I make the same histogram, but only of the data in the training set, it'll roughly have the same distribution of um, income at these different levels here for this categorical variable. Um, so notice, I mean, you know, um, I would we could try and, and do that by hand. This would be a little bit of a complex sort of uh, sampling method uh, to ensure we get what we want here. So this this might be our first example. I can't remember. This might be our first example of using something from Scikit-Learn. So we'll be using Scikit-Learn a lot 
in this class. Um, so here we're just uh, importing a particular object to do perform this sort of uh, stratified uh, sampling, right? So we want to do a train test split, uh, but not randomly. We want to pull things, we want to sample them, um, but we want to make certain that they conform to our uh, income distribution. We split them. So the way to do that is, let's see how this works. So when you have this type of an object, basically you create an instance of our stratified shuffle split. Um, and this is, you know, so notice we haven't given it the data or anything yet. So we're basically saying that um, uh, we just want it to do one split. So we'll take the original data, uh, split it once. So we'll have two resulting data sets. Um, and the test set size should be 20% again, like we had before. So we'll leave 80% for the, uh, the train set size. Um, um, this, uh, we set the random state to be 42. Uh, maybe at some point we should talk a little bit about random numbers in this class. Uh, but um, for now, it's enough to know. So you'll, you'll occasionally see us or the textbook use set a random state or set the random seed to some number. Uh, so this allows some some data is going to be randomly generated. So when we do a, a random sample or a stratified sample, we're going to be randomly selecting items and then checking that they um, conform to the distribution that we need. Uh, but but we are doing some randomness here, and so in order to reproduce the results, we need to set the seed. So if we want to get the same split every time uh, we do run this notebook. Uh, you need to set the random seed beforehand. Right? So that, that's normally what we're doing. Uh, this, this is mostly only useful when we want to write a notebook to make certain that when we discuss stuff, we'll always see the same split. But if you don't, if you don't set the seed for like a split like this, um, every time you run the split, you'll get a different uh, sample, a different split of the data set. Um, so notice, I mean, that only just sets up the, the stratified shuffle. To actually use it, um, it's, uh, it's, um, um, we, we call the split method, right? So this creates an object, uh, and then the split method actually uh, um, calls it here. Um, so I don't know, it's a little bit hard to explain why it does this, but, but basically since we do a split one time, even though we have a for loop, um, that loop is only going to execute one time. But if I need to do more than one split, I can do a, a training validation test split. I can do like uh, two splits uh, to get that to happen. Um, but in this usage here, so what happens is uh, a little bit, uh, so notice that we pass in the data frame, uh, housing again, that we want to split. Uh, using stratified shuffle, um, but we, uh, we pass a second parameter, which is the uh, variable that we want to do the shuffle, that we want to do the stratification of. Right? So, so this is how it knows what distribution we want to end up in the resulting data frames that we split out of. Um, and then the way that stratified shuffle split method works is it actually returns an array of indexes. So um, So uh, hopefully I don't have anything that takes too long here. So let's run all that above there. So again, you know, since we said 20%, we get the same number of samples uh, in both in, in the train and test set that we had before. Uh, and what's being returned from the split is again, it's just an array. So for example, we could look at that. So it's not, it's not a data set yet. So, um, We can look at the first five. Um, so, um, oh, I'm wrong. So, yeah, here. So, what's returned? What's returned from the function is really just a set of indexes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, inside of the loop, though, we actually use those indexes. Uh, so, use fancy indexing again. I guess I can't really show you um, what the values were, but basically, it's, it's going to be returned is a set of indexes. 
So, so yeah, if I look at the strat train set, uh, it really is a data frame now. So that's the first five items. But notice these are actually the row number because in this data frame, the, the index was was the row number zero through uh, 20,000 plus. But, but notice now they're all randomly shuffled. So the things in the training set, the, the item at index zero was what was originally at index 12655. Well, the next one was from index 515, 502, and so on. Um, but um, the important kind of point on that is uh, this here. So notice uh, here, uh, again, we're going to look at the distribution, so I'm not showing uh, the bar graph anymore or histogram. Um, so we just get the actual count. So this is the actual counts of that category that we created for the income. Yeah, so uh, one um, had 3% of the values, two had 30%, three had 35%, and so on. So that was the original um, that, that category before we did the split. That was the, the proportion that we had in each one of those categories. So you won't get exactly the same proportions, but after that, if the stratified shuffle is working correctly, um, you know, those proportions should be roughly equal in the train and the test set that we did the stratified shuffle. So you'll notice all of these have roughly 3.9% in category one after the split and before the split. And they roughly have 11.4% um, category five and so on. Uh, you wouldn't be guaranteed to have that uh, if you just did a random shopping. So the, 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 so the whole point of this is that uh, I just did it purely randomly. My resulting training sets might have ended up with much fewer or none for the category one, which might end up giving it a bad model if I trained with that. Um, and this, you know, this makes sense because uh, we, we create a categorical variable, but it's really from the median income. And we know that median income has the highest correlation with what we're trying to predict, the median house price. So it makes sense that we might uh, hypothesize that we need to uh, have the full range of median incomes in the data that we're training with, especially if we have some incomes that are, uh, you know, really smally represented, represented in the data set, right? So the stratified shuffle uh, will allow us to do that. Um, all right. So let's let's uh, let's move on. Talk about it the other stuff. So uh, most of the time, in chapter two is, is really spent with data cleaning, um, and this is more about uh, here's where we actually talk um, about. Um, um, Scikit-learn specifically the, the uh, um, let me just go ahead and run all these. So um, we mentioned this before. Um, you know, this data set is is a little bit of a um, you know, it's made up, it's, it's more for example purposes. But when we looked at um, the, um, um, the the describe here, one thing that we mentioned, uh, you know, one thing we were doing for this is for all the numerical values, um, did we spot if anything seems to be missing or not, right? Uh, so in this case, you know, basically this was a relatively clean data set, a real data set, probably a lot more messing than this, but there, there did look like there was one feature um, that had some missing data, right? So since the count for the total bedrooms wasn't the same as the others, some of those were were empty, were, were nuns, or, or no data was given for those. So missing data um, is, you know, one of the biggest problems with real data sets. You have to do something about those. Um, so, you know, kind of the... the um, um, Kind of the, the most extreme things is just uh, 
just to drop the samples, right? So any row that didn't have information about the total veterans, we can maybe just drop that row and not use it for the training to the task. Um, we normally, I mean, normally we want to avoid that because again, the more data we have, uh, usually that's going to give us better models. So if I've got too many rows with with the data that are going to get dropped because of that, I'm losing a lot of stuff that potentially might be useful to build good models. Right? Same thing for the you know another approach is sometimes you might have data in a data set a feature, uh, but if that feature only you know, if it's missing like over fifty or sixty percent of the values, it might not be worth keeping that feature around because there are too many missing. Uh, so, so if you try and compute, try and, and uh, guess what the values were missing were, uh, you won't be making very good guesses. So, um, so yeah, sometimes you know. Um, so the question of whether I just drop the whole row or drop the whole column usually depends on well, how many is missing. Right? So for the bedrooms, there weren't that many, so it might be valid to say, well, I, I could just ignore the couple hundred. Um, um, housing districts that didn't have that information, or, um, but you probably, you might not want to drop the whole column then, uh, because there's only maybe a couple hundred missing, so that seems like if that column is useful, um, 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 I, I lose the ability to use it for making predictions if I just drop the whole column just because, just because I'm missing a couple of hundred. So that leads to the, the third one then is, is if I want to keep it, but I need to deal with some missing things, um, uh, maybe I can guess or make up the values. Or not. And I don't, I don't want to just put a random value in there. Uh, usually I want to use something um, that would give me a value that is likely to be close to what it should have been and if it had actually gotten measured. Um, So um, yeah, if you have comment these, you can see, so yeah, if you decided to do method one or two, you could use a simple uh, pandas um, method to, um, um, so the drop in a method, you might use that for time one, um, that will drop rows. The, the default is to drop the uh, rows. Um, uh, and in this case, we're only gonna drop rows where the missing value is in the total bedrooms column. Um, so drop any districts or second one is an example of I uh, would drop the columns so you just specify the drop you can drop features or columns by giving a feature name although I don't know I never understood drop seems to the, the default for drop is to actually drop rows so if you want to drop columns you have to specify access one um, or um, here's a simple example of imputing so, uh, but this is common. So if you, if you don't have a lot missing, uh, just filling in the missing ones with the, the average for that or the median, the mean of the median, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's a pretty common thing to do. It can be a little bit unsafe. If you have too many, um, you might want to do something a little bit more um, sophisticated than just taking the average, but if it's not too many, uh, that'll at least get you going, right? Because the, the reason why we're doing this, if we want to use that column, we can't leave in uh, um, nuns or, or NAs. So we can't leave in missing values before we train a model with it. So we have to have an actual numerical value. So we have to do something to fill in those. So um, a pretty quick thing is just to replace the missing ones with the, the value, the average for that. And that at least won't be too far off. So. Like if we did that, so this will rerun. So um, if we rerun that down to here, but we go ahead and um, um, say fill in the, the NA. NA uh, means not available. So uh, that's a special value that's used by like pandas and also by NumPy. 
So you see NA or NAN for not a number. Uh, if, if something becomes like too big or too small to represent. Right? So in for pandas, for data frames, uh, things will be NA. So anything that's NA or NAN um, will get filled in uh, with that value here in this case. So if we do that, um, hmm. oh, um, so we, we can get what the median value is for that feature um, real easily from pandas by just calling the median function on it. Um, so the point of that is that now the total bedrooms has the same number as everything else. Um, so my housing here has been split. I've only got 16,000. Don't remember what I did there, but yeah, we, we've got 16,000 uh, uh, samples now. But all of, not, nothing's missing now since we filled in the, the median. Um, So wanted to get that back out. So um, we can um, we can do that by hand, but uh, you know, Scikit Learn uh, has uh, methods to help you, uh, you know, create fill in missing values. So there's more than just the simple one. So this, and the simple imputer uh, supports. Um, Uh, oops. Pull up the help documentation here. Um, so the simple computer, um, um, if you look at the strategies, you, know, you can have it fill in. So, so we have it fill in the uh, the median like we were doing by hand. We can ask it to do the mean or find the most frequent value or give it a constant value. Uh, there, so I guess those are the only strategies that it has. Um, so the equivalent to what we did uh, by hand is, so we create one of these like learn objects. Um, and then we are Fitting it on, you know, on, so this should fit in the in up fitting all of the values. So I can't remember exactly why we dropped. Oh, the the imputer probably doesn't work on numerical uh, on strings or something. But here we had to first drop the um, the column that's not going to work on before we can run the imputer. But every everything that's missing in this data frame should get uh, filled in with the median for that column, right? So if there was other things besides the number of bedrooms. Missing, it would also fill in those with the median for that feature. Use right? that strategy, uh, and there's ways. If, if you only want to, you know, fill in, you want to use different strategies, so you only want to go into the bigger column and specify which columns to uh, uh, run the, you know, fill in, run the computer on. So. Um. Okay, so there's one more thing. So I mean, I still still got uh, the the third part of this, but we can we can talk about that next week too. Um, um, uh, I kind of want to talk about feature scaling, um, uh, and also categorical attributes here. So. We, we've mentioned this ocean proximity before, right? So it's an example of a categorical attribute, uh, but it's still been just a string, you know, still been just an object up to this point so far, right? But it's got things like inland, near ocean, stuff like that. Um, so we can't 
most machine learning algorithms, you know, like scikit learn, uh, it can't really do things with strings. Everything has to be a number for it to be able to build a model. So if we have information that's like a categorical variable, uh, we have to convert it into uh, some sort of numerical representation before we can train a model with it, right? uh, which is what this section is all about. So, you know, we can, we can see that, that as a string, um, you know, we've got um, this distribution of our different categories. We've only got like two uh, regions that are on islands, actually. Uh, it's a very underrepresented category. Um, so there's kind of really two main ways you can encode a categorical variable. You can use the, um, uh, just as a number. So that's what the ordinal encoder does. It just uh, assigns an integer to every one of these categories. So instead of these strings, we have maybe one means less than one hour, two means inland, so on. So that's really all the or fancy name ordinal means. We're assigning an integer. Um, so yeah, if we create an ordinal encoder um, and we transform it, you'll see if, if you look at that value, uh, it's zero to five, basically, or zero to four, basically, because there were five categories that we've assigned zero. You know, uh, these should correspond to um, uh, the information here. So zero was the less than one hour to the ocean, one was assigned to inland, and so on. Um, so, you know, if you need to, or, or you, know, you can ask the encoder what it did, right? So here, uh, this order, you know, is gonna be the same. So the item at index zero got assigned an integer of zero. So that's our less than one. So one is gonna be inland, two is gonna be island. Don't see any of those. Three is gonna be near bay, four is gonna be the near ocean. Um, so uh, I've gone a little bit long here, but, um, um, Sometimes the order of a categorical variable is important. It might be important in this case because uh, it makes sense. So, so it's really measuring kind of how close you are to the ocean. So there's a natural order in this category. If you're on the island or near the ocean, or right on the ocean, or you're, you're really near it versus going further and further away. Right. So uh, this might be the natural order. Right. So near the bay, assuming the bay is close to the ocean, but if you're near the bay, you're a little bit further from the ocean than if you're near the ocean, you're actually on an island. Less than one hour from the island, then inland is probably the furthest away. Right? The reason why this is important is because there might be some correlation you know, between the thing we're trying to model um, and that distance. So if the ordering matters, you can, you should, whenever you, uh, turn a categorical variable into a numeric, you should ensure that it uh, has the ordering that, that is important or makes sense for the categorical variable. So uh, the ordinal encoder for scikit-learn, it comes down to, you can give it, so if I want it to use this order for zero, one, two, three, four, you can just pass in uh, a, a list I guess it's a list of lists, I don't know why, but you can pass in something that specifies that. So the result is um, that uh, now, you know, zero is island, one is near ocean, two, three, four, in the order that we need for this variable. Um, if order doesn't matter, a um, uh, common thing to do, you know, the categories must have a particular ordering. Uh, that can actually confuse it if you need it as a, uh, that one ordinal value is one integer. So uh, instead, sometimes uh, you might want to use a one-hot encoding. So usually, only want to do this if there is no order for the categorical variable, no intrinsic order, which might not be really the case here for R. So uh, if you don't know what a one-hot is, it's basically like this. So instead of getting one resulting feature with an integer value, uh, we had five categories. So now we're going to get five features, five columns. Uh, and, but each one represents one of the five categories, right? So uh, if column one here is for the near ocean, only the things that were near ocean will have one there and there'll be zero everywhere else, right? So here, if that was um, whatever it was, so if that was uh, on an island, only that one will be one and everything else will be zero for a one-hot code, right? Uh, 
Um, and when you do a one hot encoding, you know, I originally had five categories. You'll end up with five new columns, five new features, one for each of the categories. So that's a one hot encoding. Um, all right. And um, I mean, it is 145. Let's, I'm going to wrap up there. I mean, you know, um, um, there's feature scaling and then we, can, we still need to talk about actually building a model, but uh, that's fine. We still got time to go over the stuff. So we'll pick this stuff up um, next week, next Thursday. Although, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you should get started on the next chapter um, because uh, there'll be, we'll, we'll get into the uh, chapter three stuff as well next week. All right, um, that's it for today. I'll wrap it up. I can stick around for a bit. I have my office hours as usual. Uh, after this class, I'll be over in science. Five, right? uh, otherwise, see you guys uh, next week then.